The Discourses of Epictetus, Book 1, Chapter 12, of Contentment. Concerning gods, there are some who say that the divine does not so much as exist, and others that it exists indeed, but is inactive and indifferent, and takes forethought for nothing, and a third set that it exists and takes forethought, though only for great and heavenly things, and in no case for terrestrial things, and a fourth set that it also takes forethought for things terrestrial in the affairs of men, but only in a general way, and not for the individual in particular, in a fifth set to which Odysseus and Socrates belonged, who say, Nor when I move am I concealed from thee. We must therefore first of all inquire about each of these statements to see whether it is sound or not sound. For if gods do not exist, how can it be an end to follow the gods? And if they exist, indeed, but care for nothing, how even thus will that conclusion be sound? But if indeed they both exist and exercise care, yet there is no communication from them to men, yes, and by Zeus to me personally, how even in this case can our conclusion still be sound? The good and excellent man must, therefore, inquire into all these things before he subordinates his own will to him who administers the universe, precisely as a good citizen submits to the law of the state. And he that is instructed ought to come to his instruction with this aim. How may I follow the gods in everything? And how may I be acceptable to the divine administration? And how may I become free? Since he is free for whom all things happen according to his moral purpose, and whom none can restrain. What then is freedom and sanity? Far from it, for madness and freedom are not consistent with one another. But I would have that which seems best to me happen in every case, no matter how it comes to seem so. You are mad. You are beside yourself. Do you not know that freedom is a noble and precious thing? But for me to desire at haphazard that those things should happen which have at haphazard seem best to me is dangerously near being not merely not noble, but even in the highest degree shameful. For how do we act in writing? Do I desire to write the name Dio as I choose? No, but I am taught to write it as it ought to be written. What do we do in music? The same. And what in general, where there is any art or science? The same. Otherwise, knowledge of anything would be useless if it were accommodated to every individual's whim. Is it then only in this matter of freedom, the greatest and indeed highest of all that I am permitted to desire at haphazard? By no means. But instruction consists precisely in learning to desire each thing exactly as it happens. And how do they happen? As he that ordained them has ordained. And he has ordained that there be summer and winter, and abundance and dearth, and virtue and vice, and all such opposites, for the harmony of the whole. And he has given each of us a body and members of the body, and property and companions. Mindful, therefore, of this ordaining, we should go to receive instruction, not in order to change the constitution of things, for this is neither vouchsafed us, nor is it better that it should be, but in order that the things about us being as they are and as their nature is, we may, for our own part, keep our wills in harmony with what happens. For look you, can we escape from men, and how is it possible? But can we, if they associate with us, change them? And who vouchsafes us that power? What alternative remains, then, or what method can we find for living with them? Some such method as that, while well, they will act as seems best to them, we shall nonetheless be in a state comfortable to nature. But you are impatient and peevish, and if you are alone, you call it a solitude. But if you are in a company of men, you call them schemers and brigands, and you find fault even with your own parents and children and brothers and neighbors. But you ought, while staying alone, to call that peace and freedom, and to look upon yourself as like the gods. And when you are in the company of many, you ought not to call that a mob, nor a tumult, nor a disgusting thing, but a feast and a festival and so accept all things contentedly. What, then, is the punishment of those who do not accept? To be just as they are. Is one peevish because he is alone? Let him be in solitude. Is he peevish with his parents? Let him be an evil son and grieve. Is he peevish with his children? Let him be a bad father. Throw him into prison. What sort of prison? Where he is now, for he is there against his will, and where a man is against his will, that for him is a prison. Just as Socrates was not in prison, for he was there willingly. Alas, that I should be lame in my leg. Slave, do you then, because of one paltry leg, blame the universe? Will you not make a free gift of it to the whole? 
Will you not relinquish it? Will you not gladly yield it to the giver? And will you be angry and peevish at the ordinances of Zeus, which he defined and ordained together with the fates, who spun in his presence the threads of your beginning? Do you not know how small a part you are compared with the whole? That is, as to the body, for as to reason you are not inferior to the gods, nor less than they, for the greatness of the reason is not determined by length nor by height, but by decisions of its will. Will you not, therefore, set what is for you the good in that wherein you are the equal to the gods? Wretched man that I am, such a father and such a mother I have. Well, was it permitted you to step forward and make selection, saying, Let such and such man have intercourse with such and such woman at this hour that I may be born? It was not permitted you, but your parents had to exist first. Then you had to be born as you were born. Of what kind of parents? Of such as they were. What then? Since they are such, is no remedy given you? Again, supposing that you were ignorant of the purpose for which you possess the faculty of vision, you would be unfortunate and wretched if you closed your eyes when men brought some color before them. But in that you have greatness of mind and ability for use for every one of the things may happen to you, and know it not, are you not yet more unfortunate and wretched? Things proportionate to the faculty which you possess are brought before you, but you turn that faculty away at the very moment when you ought to keep it wide open and discerning. Do you not rather render thanks to the gods that they have allowed you to be superior to all the things that they did not put under your control, and have rendered you accountable only for what is under your control? As for parents, the gods have released you from accountability. As for brothers, they have released you. As for body, they have released you. And for property, death, life. Well, for what have they made you accountable? For the only thing that is under your control, the proper use of impressions. Why then do you draw upon yourself? that for which you are not responsible. This is to make trouble for yourself.